CFB paint back for another week. This is what week seven recap. Is that right? Yep. Man, I, I'm I'm disturbed at how quickly the season is moving. It's like it, I'm gonna blink and it'll be February and I'll be starving for it again. It's a problem. Anyway, big week this week. Um, you want to start with the midweek games? You want to jump in? I, I don't know what you're. If you had like headline takeaways. Yeah, I'll give you my thoughts. Um, sure. Parity for fo- college football is, is good, and we're seeing lots of parity. We have four top 25 games go to overtime, the most since overtime has been instituted in 1996. We look at SEC. You've always had tr- perennial powerhouses of Alabama and Georgia. Well, Alabama sh- lost to Vandy, struggles with South Carolina. Georgia lost to Bama, Bama and then has a closer game against Mississippi State. Uh, let's see what other games like you have had LSU. a closer game against Kentucky earlier too. Exactly, yeah. Uh, LSU beats Ole Miss in overtime. Uh, Tennessee beats beats Georgia in overtime. You get the fun game over of Oregon and uh, Ohio State. Just mm-hmm. a lot of teams. There's there's not many teams that are just better than everybody else because people can buy the players and it's evening out the playing field. Then making making some great games. So I'm loving this. The weeks that should be slow are not slow. They're just great games. So I, it's been a great first half of the season. Could, couldn't agree more. I think there's been at least two or three really, I mean, usually more, but you, at least that many every Saturday this uh, of this season. Um, the midweek games have also been pretty fun. Uh, even the ones, like, I feel like I am becoming... Part of it is, like, I don't love the way that some elements of the sport are going, which we've talked about here, like... I don't like the fact that there's sort of this separation between like the power two and power four and, and how they're leaving sort of the group of five slash six now behind and, and those two other, you know, power conferences that aren't true power conferences. I kind of hate all that. And so I just have learned to lean into like, you know what, I'm going to tune into that Sunbelt game on Tuesday and I'm not going to, I'm not going to care. And it's just, yeah, it's been a, a kind of cathartic for me to just say, you know what, there are parts of the sport that I still really enjoy. And, and in some cases, the sport's never been better. Um, but in, in other ways, of course, it's it's been kind of some of the fabric of the sport has been changed pretty dramatically. But, yeah. I mean, it all disappears once toe meets leather. And for those few hours, everything's right in the world. So, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> Um, yeah, so, and I wanted to call it, like, you mentioned the overtimes, but how many of those were with, I think, two of those were non-ranked teams taking ranked teams to overtime. Was was there three? Tennessee, Tennessee, Florida, Florida. USC, Penn State. Yep. And I'm missing the last one. What was the other overtime game that I can't think of off the top of my head? Oh, Oh, Purdue, Illinois. That was it. Yeah. So another one. Um. Yeah, 23 points scored by Purdue in, in the fourth quarter to force overtime. Uh, Impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, well done, Boilermakers. Maybe you get it done this next week against the Ducks. We'll see. <laughs> um, uh, specific games. I Let's see. I got eyes on – I got eyes on Texas, Oklahoma. Did you want to talk about that one? Let's talk about I don't know it, if yeah. you were able to see any of that. Okay, so yeah. – it, it, like, it's funny how close the very beginning of this game felt like it was to, to the, the year prior, where immediate turnover, uh, Oklahoma gets the ball, and I was like, okay, they're they're ready to play. Um, gosh, Jimmy Greenbeans. What's his actual name? I'm blanking on the head coach's name. Who? Brent Venables, who? thank you. Okay. Um, like, yeah, Brent Venables. Jimmy Greenbeans is his alter ego that plays scout team quarterback. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. I've heard that. Oh, he yeah, he, he calls. That's what he calls himself when he's playing scout team quarterback, working with his defense. Um, anyway, yeah. So they force a turnover right right away, uh, and I think in that opening series they had a sack and got an interception. Uh, weren't able to cash it in for anything. But it was just like, okay, the defense is ready. Uh, and they were until they weren't is kind of, kind of how, how, how that happened. You know, Oklahoma takes a quick uh, 3-0 lead after a couple of empty possessions from both teams. And then Texas finds its footing. 21 points in the, in the second quarter. 
Um, beyond that point, I think that was essentially when we turned over to focus strictly on the BYU game in our house to keep keep everyone happy. Um, but yeah, Texas was it was exactly what they needed to be. They they weren't really giving up much um, defensively, uh, and so it really was just kind of like, all right, we'll we'll take take the time that our offense needs to kind of find a way to uh, to navigate what Oklahoma's defense is doing. Um, I haven't had a chance to like really like dig into like specific formations or anything like that. But yeah, they played, uh, they played a solid game. Um, 31 point victory in uh, against your biggest rival. And, and they kind of didn't sweat really after that second quarter, once they kind of established that they realized you know, there's, there's not really a whole lot more for us to, to prove here. And it felt like they sort of shut it down after that. I mean, they, they ended up scoring 13 points in the second half, but I, Texas is one of few teams that I feel like super confident in that they're sort of a, a national title contender. Um, yeah, Texas feels like one of the few very complete teams. Like they have a good, strong defense and a strong offense, and you can expect them to, to kind of show up every year. They haven't had a, a game where they've been like, oh, what's going on here? They flirted a little bit with Mississippi State, but like Mississippi State just kind of ran the ball in, in that game. The, game the, the score was never in doubt. Yeah, and, and they've had I think they've had spells where one maybe goes out like the offense isn't isn't has a few drives in a row where it's not really moving the football, but the defense is always there to pick them up or vice versa, right? Like there, there's been some times where they've given up, given up some points, given up some yardage, and and uh, but they always the the offense supplies the defense with a, a big enough lead to defend that they're they're able to kind of move some of the you know they're, they're they can live with some of the the points being put up by. By competitors and by and large, I mean they, the most points they've given up on the season. Have you looked at it? Do you know? Um, if I was to guess, oh, I, I bet you it's Mississippi State. Um, and I you're guess correct. Seventeen, thirteen, thirteen. Okay. The most they've given up is thirteen points this season. So, uh, salty defense combined with a Sark offense, and yeah, you're doing we're, good. We're, to see a little bit more. Um, they haven't played the toughest of competitions. They've had a little bit easier of a schedule than Oklahoma. Fair. But we get to play Georgia this next week. And so we get to see what that, that play how they how they play handle that. So Yeah, in the back half you've got Georgia at Vanderbilt, which should not apparently be underestimated. <laughs> at Arkansas, who's always game. They, they've been they played everyone close pretty much this, this whole yeah. year. And then at Texas A and M. So uh yeah, you're right. You could you could argue that, you know, the, the competition they've played to this point hasn't been stellar and, and I, I wouldn't argue with with you there but we're, we're gonna we're gonna see what that goes now that you've got a um, step up with competition and i'm probably insulting florida and kentucky by not including them but that's that's the entire back half of their schedule yeah. no slouches in there more or less so but yeah they should be able to handle business i mean they've handled business against michigan they've handled business against you know i mean your rivals oklahoma granted like those are two teams that have good defenses not as good offenses, but you still were able to put up 30 points on both of those defenses. So, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, at this point, I think they're sort of my favorite to win it all. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my takeaways from this game were uh, Quinn Ewers took a little bit of time to settle in. Um, I might like Arch Manning better than Quinn Ewers at quarterback, but that might be controversial. But they're both great quarterbacks. It took a little while to settle in, once he did settle in, they were fine. Um, the biggest takeaway from here is it's not Jackson Arnold's issue. It's not a uh, Michael Hawkins issue. This is a Seth Luttrell issue, like, in my opinion. Oh. The coordinator at Oklahoma is the problem. And I, I saw a comment out there. I'm, I'm not going to take credit for this, but it's very true. It's like if Brent Venables can't figure out an offensive coordinator, he's going to be just like Lincoln Riley was without a defense. He doesn't have an offense. Because, I mean, Seth Luttrell is what? His history is um, – Learning underneath Mike Leach, and then goes into uh, was a head coach in North Texas, and then yeah, all. UNT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like not very much of a proven uh, person, a pr proven offensive identity in those in those with North Texas as much either. So I'm kind of like a little surprised that you turn over the reins to him, but like you also spurned Jackson Arnold a little bit to give it to Michael, give the reins over to Michael Hawkins, and Michael Hawkins has not looked any better. He's looked much worse with the ball, in my opinion. Um, just because with his casualness when he runs the ball, uh, I think he had what two fumbles in this game at least that, that ended up on the other for the other team. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just not impressed. You got to find a new OC, and you got Seth Lewis Charles got to be fired. Like if you're gonna have any chance to be be venerable, it's true. That's how it's got to work. Oh, that's a 
Those are bold, bold statements. Like, how much would you put on like the fact that they're like I think their top five wide receivers they expected to play this year are are out. I, I feel like that gives you a pass. I feel like no. You- Receivers are out. Your offensive line sucks. Your quarterback sucks. That can't be everything when when you've been recruiting that much well from Oklahoma. Like, like, let's look at Florida State. Florida State's offensive line is okay. The receivers suck. The quarterback play has sucked. But they're still not. I mean, if you look at the OU, they've put up 19 points for on offense since they played anybody with a heartbeat. I think Tulane they put up a little few more. Um, uh, but it, yeah, I think it's only Tulane they put up like 34. But then again, Auburn, they scored 27. Eight of that comes from the defense. Um, like, they're, they're not scoring the ball. And if you're not going to score over 20 points, you're not going to win. I would tell totally you this. I don't disagree. I just, like, I, I know this harkens back to when, and it's I'm not necessarily drawing an exact comparison, but um, at a school we're more familiar with Kalani Sitake in his second year hired Ty Detmer as his offensive coordinator. I can't remember what happened to his previous offensive coordinator or was it, he was maybe it was the offensive coordinator the first year where they went nine and four and the second year they go four and nine and he gets fired, but you're on your fourth string quarterback by the end of the year. It's like, what do you want me to do? I, that I'm kind of like when your hands are tied that far behind your back, five deep at wide receiver, I think is plenty. And when they all go down, that's, that's a, catastrophic like uh c- like the, the, for the injuries to be so concentrated on one room it, even where yeah it, in theory you're probably carrying anywhere between eight and 12 quarterbacks depending on what what offense you're running but like that's so many to be out it's hard for me to say we're, we're ready to, to to drop the axe on this guy my thought process is you had you had jackson arnold who's a talent you had you had michael hawkins who's also talent and you have javante barnes in the backfield you should be able to find something in to some degree of, of offense between those three players. I mean, both Jackson Arnold was no slouch in moving. Michael Hawkins is moving. If you need to run the run a version of a triple option or some pistol uh, action to kind of get that defense moving, you need to adapt. And it doesn't seem like they've adapted well enough, in my opinion. I know we're only six games into his, his, his tenure, but it has not looked good. No, no arguments there. Uh, all right. Um, sorry, I, I navigated away from my little score summary page here. Um, a couple of other games that I looked at. Oh, wait, wait, can we talk Southern Cal or not Southern Cal? Sorry, um, South Carolina, Alabama in the noon slate leading up to this. Now, I did not see the. I, I caught like the tail end of the second quarter, and then most of the second half. So I went back and rewatched the game as well. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I feel like South Carolina has kind of beat themselves a little bit. You have four turnovers in the game. Um, your quarterback, a freshman quarterback, plays pretty darn well. He has his best game all year, completing 74% of his passes against Alabama's defense. And, like, you gave yourself every opportunity. You score – like, you get up on them. You score late even when you're behind – you miss a two-point conversion, and then you give yourself an onside kick, and you just cannot close the door. Bama survives. Um, yeah, I get that the, the people in Bama have been angry about this, but, like, Kalen DeBoer, if you look at his history, anywhere he's been, the, his first year he drops one or two games that are, he probably shouldn't drop. He kind of figures things out. I think it, I think his first week year at Washington he lost, like, three or four. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But that first year is not – the expectation that we have with Kalen DeBoer. Then the next year, he uh, he auto adjusts everything else. I do think there's a little bit of um, I, I get the angst that they're like, oh, we've gone from this strict saving to this player coach. I think the player coach can still work at this level. There, he's not going to let the players walk all over him. He's going to win win games. He just has to make sure he continues to get his personnel right and, and where he wants to go right. The defense has got to make some better adjustments and, and figure out how they do the communication because that Bama back, that Bama back four or so, um, it's been struggling in the last little bit. You look at this game, they let up 74% completions. You look up the game before that, um, Vanderbilt's quarterback completes uh, 80% of his passes. You go to the Georgia game, Carson Beck doesn't complete a ton of his, or like percentage-wise only completes like 54%, but he throws for over 400 and something yards against you. There's an issue in that back four with the communication and figuring anything out. You're, you're playing true freshmen too, so they're, they're going to get used to playing out there, but that's the one thing that's got to be fixed. But, but I'm 
the other kid under him comes up, he's like, what the hell is this South Carolina team? Like, who knows? This, like, <laughs> I can't make heads or tails of them because, like, every time I try, they do. There's another result that surprises me. That's what I was going to say. My like, so my heart breaks for South Carolina. So LSU, they host LSU. They have them on the ropes, up 17 to nothing in that game. End up losing by three. Bama, they have the lead uh, at what 19 to 14, and then lose that in the in in the second and half. The ball and you fumble it. To give Bama the chance to get back in the game. Yeah, that really kind of allowed them to retake the lead. Yeah, it's it's brutal. Um, and the, the the shame that I am concerned, like, I know some people, I, I heard whispers, it's just like, look, Shane Beaver's not going to last there. I'm like, man, I think you got a dude. Like, I, I know he may not be the best X's and O's coach. He's a heck of a recruiter. They punch way above their weight class in terms of, like, what they're able to get on the recruiting trail versus what you would expect South Carolina outside of maybe two or three years with Spurrier. Like, outside of that little pocket of time, South Carolina has always been a doormat. And this year they're 3-3, three and three, but they're like two plays away from being 5-1 and one with wins against LSU and on the road at Bama. Like, Yeah. I, I, I think if you lose Beamer, I mean, what, do you go back to Muschamp where you get waxed by Clemson every year? Like. Yeah, I was going to say, it could be a lot worse. So I, I, I don't think we have any USC fans that listen to us, but if, if, if there is one out there, let us be the voice of reason that, man, I feel like you're just, you're inches away from this being really special. Oh, and the passion that Beamer has. I mean, you're starting a, a freshman at quarterback. You're, you're going to have some issues here. It's going to be a rough season. But, like, the passion that Beamer has for, you, for your fan base and for your team, he's not going anywhere. And as soon as this kind of – like, we're seeing a good progression in the right direction still. Like, in my opinion, we have. And you have some pieces. Like you said, your freshman quarterback, Lenore Sellers, who looks – he looks like a full-grown man. Like, oh, dude. I, I, and I, then I, Dylan Stewart's a true back, freshman on the defensive back. end. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's that. But then you also have the Nick Harbour, who's just a physical freak, the six foot five, yeah. two, 220, 230-ish wide receiver that's also an Olympic hopeful in track. Like uh, they've got some pieces. Like I, I, this is where I would preach, p- preach patience to the South Carolina fan base. Like give it some time. I and they just you. had their best offensive line class. Uh, I, I to, to my knowledge ever this last year, they're true freshmen right now. G- yeah. Give it one more year and two more years. Things are going to, you'll be cooking. I'm interested to see this. Uh, uh, we've just talked to OU Texas game. We're talking about Bama South Carolina game. OU and and South Carolina play yes. games. Yes. Like, Fascinating game. I looked at the line. I was like, it's at Oklahoma. It's minus three. So basically on a neutral, they're favor or they're, they're even. And that, that's exactly how I'm like. If you told me to pick, I'd be like, Bing! which team's going to show up? Is South Carolina going to be able to score the uh, score against them? Is Oklahoma going to be able to stop them? Oklahoma doesn't have an offense. So I tend to lean South Carolina on here a little bit. But what's the point total Oklahoma's- in that game? <laughs> It's only 40 four. and a half. Yeah, okay. Well, I was going to say, it's, it better be something pretty low because Oklahoma has a defense and uh, Oklahoma doesn't have an offense. I don't know. Yeah, that one's, that one's interesting because the other part that I was going to point out is like, if you're South Carolina, like, like you've had two nasty gut shots this season where you had just like everything in front of you and, and found ways to lose those games. Like, how do you get up off the mat here? Because they didn't do it. For, I mean, I, I guess when they lost to LSU, the next week they played Akron 50 to 7. I don't put a whole lot of stock in that result. The next true opportunity they had to play a, a team of, of significance was Ole Miss. They lost by 24 points. So, like, what, what weren't competitive in that game? Just so, FYI, that's the lowest total for next week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the, ser- the service academies are out, out here running up the score on people, and, and this one's over here with a. Well, even Iowa and Northwestern, those games are at forty-one. <laughs> Iowa put up like what forty something points on Washington. That was yeah. surprising. I expected that to be a close game, uh, and I think Iowa nearly outdid the total themselves. So I was off on that one, but we'll <laughs> talk about bets uh, a little bit later. A couple of other games I wanted to just quickly touch on. I guess we got to talk BYU Arizona. Did you see that game? I watched I can... that game. Yeah. Okay, I watched all the last two minutes when I headed headed over to to babysit. Um, yeah. Well, you appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Anytime. Um, I mean, like 
are, is it time for us to just say, okay, like BYU is a pretty good team. Like they're just pretty good. I still think they've been kind of fortunate with the turnovers. So like that part, I, I expect at some point to go to taper off, but I mean, they don't turn the ball over, at least not, not lately near as much as they were the first two games of the season. I was like, this is going to catch up and this is going to haunt them. Uh, and they just to mostly to Jake Retzloff's credit, like he's been much more uh, in control. Like he's still kind of a gunslinger. He'll force it into windows but there haven't been like a ton of dropped interceptions. Like in the beginning of the season, like he had some turnovers and there could have been a lot more. I can't remember exactly how many times he turned out the ball. Or I want to say like three times in those three times a game in the first couple of games. Yeah. And it could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, and, and really, I, I think the number of times that my heart has sunk or, or like I gasped because he put the ball in harm's way has been, pretty much non-existent in the last couple of weeks. There may have been one or two, but, but nothing that really jumps out at me. Um, Arizona, no Fafita has come back down to earth this year. Uh, it kind of hurts my heart a little bit, hope, hoping he can find a way to turn it around. I, I think um, that's a result of a coach change too, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one of those things that we have to maybe track going forward is like for, for teams that have a coaching change, and they're able to retain the talent, like how well does that translate to a new scheme? Because the other thing that was interesting is he forced the ball against BYU a few times. It's like, Oh, the crossing routes open below. You're forcing it to the guy over top and you're lucky it doesn't get picked off or it does get picked off when you decide to go for the end zone instead of um, my, my takeaways are this, this BYU team plays in spurts. The defense plays in spurts. The offense plays in spurts, everything like, there's been multiple games where I'm like, wow, Red's laugh is a, is a good quarterback. He's playing really well. And then he'll go the next quarter without a completion. He hasn't thrown a pick, but he hasn't, like, he's the ball's behind everybody constantly. You watch Darius Lasseter yelling at him, like, what the heck? Put the ball in front of me. Of course, the next play, he puts the ball in front of him. Darius Lasseter drops it. Drops it. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't have time for that. Yeah, no. I, <laughs> Complain that, that about was... that when, when, when you're going to drop the ball, like, hey, it doesn't matter if I throw it behind you. You might drop it anyway. Yeah. Um, um, but, like, this team plays in spurts. You have that blow, explosion against Kansas State. You have the explosion against Baylor in the first quarter. Even here against uh, Arizona, you, you have this explosion in, in the third quarter where you all of a sudden have two interceptions or two, uh, you know, it's an interception and a fumble recovery to set yourself up with 10 points. They just have these little spurts and they keep themselves in it. Um, so looking at the rest of their schedule, there's not a game they can't win. Um, and the games are, might be looking more favorable for them. Do we dare say that BYU has a chance to play for the Big 12 championship and be in a playoff? Knock on wood. But I mean, like, it's, it's... we're, we're going to curse them right now. My wife's never going to forgive me. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I was telling her, I was looking at their schedule. And I was like, okay, like, next game is home versus Oklahoma State, which they're coming off a bye. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a short week for BYU. They're coming off a bye. Who knows? At UCF, it's long travel, but UCF's been three losses in a row. Yeah, three losses in a row. They made a change at QB. I'm not sure if that was just for that game, but we'll have to see. Now that that part will be interesting because I don't know how well BYU will handle a, like a super mobile quarterback. Which either one of those quarterbacks is probably more mobile. But they did. They played KJ Jefferson twice, right? Yeah, they played him twice at Arkansas. Yeah. And I don't know, the, the travel combined with just kind of the unique offense that UCF runs, like there's there's some concern there. Then you're on a bye week and then you get ready for Utah. And I'm assuming it's going to be Isaac Wilson. I mean, we can talk about Utah in just a minute, but. Yeah, Cam Rising's sorry, out for the year. They just did they out. say that? They said it indefinitely. I don't know if they said. But I, okay. I'm it's yeah, it's for the year. Okay, good point. Like, uh, yeah, it, I am expecting him to never touch the field again in a youth yeah. uniform. I saw somebody tweet something saying, "Oh, Cam will play. He'll, he'll be playing next year for some ACC team for his twelfth year or something like that." <laughs> uh, um, he wouldn't be the first. Like, about BYU, going back to BYU, their schedule. It's I don't expect them to be favored or or an underdog by more than like four or five points the entire season. So that they, they could very well lose six games and I would not be surprised because these games are going to be close. These talent, the talent is close. The f crazy thing is, is I expected the games that they played to also be close or for them to lose those games. And they've been blowing game teams out of the water a little bit sometimes. Um, 
count your lucky stars. You, you already beat your win total. Enjoy the season. Every single BYU fan I talked to that I said this is going to be a better year than you expect told me I was wrong. I'm going to take my my um, kudos and, and say you got better than you expected. Just enjoy what you have now. Yeah, anything you get from here on out is icing on the cake, and, and it is all still in front of you. And not to mention, like, it's all still in front of you. And, you know, there's, what, two other undefeated teams left in the conference. There's – you have a little bit of a head start in terms of the conference race too, so you can – afford a blunder i think you can probably afford one yeah uh, yeah because iowa state and texas tech play each other so they're one of them is losing right yeah. so you can you can lose one more game and you have so far you have the tiebreakers over one oh just okay i guess just one of the one loss teams so far in kansas state but you play arizona state so you you kind of control your own destiny there you don't play cincinnati or colorado i, I don't know spoiler alert i don't expect either of those two to end the season with just one conference loss but agreed um yeah i i, I yeah, everything's on the table for him so yeah that's that's exciting um other results that we want to cover i think we should jump into that utah arizona state game yes okay so i actually finally like br- dusted off the cfb paint twitter i don't know if you saw this but <laughs> tweeted a little bit during that game uh so if you've seen that you know my opinions on this and it's funny, I was talking to a buddy, a buddy of mine called me, um, and he was, we were talking football, he was driving home from a, a networking event that he was at for uh, the alumni chapter of his, uh, his, his MBA. Uh, yeah, pish posh. Um, but he was like, he's like, I, I can't wait to get home and watch that game, the, the Arizona State-Utah game. And I'm like on the phone with him just chatting while the game's on. And just like, I felt like every three plays, I was like, yeah, Cam Rising is going to cost them this game. Like Whitney's oh, yeah. to pull him. He can't. He can't throw the ball. He's clearly inaccurate, mostly undershooting. But a couple times, I think he tried to over, he overcorrected and then sailed he, it. Like he was shot putting the ball down the field in, in that yeah. glove. It was couldn't, weird looking. Well, and couldn't step through with the the yeah. ankle that got rolled up. Like uh, he just looked broken, right? Like I'm not trying to be mean. Like, no. like at some point, this is we got to be charitable to this individual, right? He's clearly not okay he's clearly hurting and you're making him a target in ways where it's like they don't have to respect his passing they play the run and every time he is dropping back to pass they're teeing off because they know he can't throw it and they know that he can't get away from them with his legs like when two-thirds of your options as a as an offense are exhausted that's a problem like you got to fix that the other issue is is like it's it's him but it's on kyle willingham like honestly like you're Defense kept you in the game. I think you were at one point in time, you're up 17 or something like that to 13. Let me look at the play by play real quick. Um, I was re- remember watching that, like thinking like, oh, in the fourth quarter, they're still up or have a chance to win. Let's see. Defense gave him, uh, I've got a chance or a comment or a note here. It says defense gave you a chance to win this even with nine minutes left. Um, yeah. You're up 20 to 19. Um, and then you're on 20. Like you're able, you, you basically force them, uh, force ASU off the field um, and you have a turnover on downs and then you have a field goal. But like, in the second half, you should have put Isaac Wilson in. That kid's not going to lose you the game. He sure is not going to – he might win it for you, but you're going to have at least a little bit of a threat of an offense to pass, passing game. Like, it, the the coaching decision was baffling because all us amateurs could see that, that there was an issue. Yeah, that's the part that's most surprising to me is, like, I, I was, like, convinced, like, even, like, heading into half, I was like, okay, maybe they're just trying to get through the first half and then at halftime, they talked through, okay, we're making a switch at QB. Here are the three or four plays that we feel most comfortable with. Let's let's kind of maybe put together a brief game script for, like, the first offensive possession out of the half. No, nothing changed. I, yeah, I, I, I'm i a little surprised. Um, and so now it's Isaac Wilson going forward. But I feel like, man, you made that decision now, like, it's almost too late. Like, yeah, why could yeah. you do that the time? I, 100%. Yeah, like, I, I feel like it's, I mean, maybe they get a chance again. The Big 12, we do expect to be kind of a topsy-turvy league with, with the amount of parity that's there. But two conference losses, you, the margin for error now is razor thin. I have to plug in my laptop. So, sorry, sorry. I will listen. You talk. Um, let me get my cord. Sorry. Um. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Uh, Cam Rising looked hot or looked hurt. Everything got, was thrown short. Um. Scadaboo, the the running back for Arizona State, 
crushed it with two long, long runs and then a crucial uh, conversion catch. And that guy's also, my hero. Being being a, a a broadcaster saying the name Scadaboo over and over and over again got to be so much fun. I'm so <laughs> like. Um, also, when Le- Levitt got hurt, it was weird seeing Jeff Sims playing quarterback. Oh, my like, gosh. Oh. Yes. Like, Sorry. I mean, commits to Florida State. They don't – he ends up going to Georgia Tech, playing for Nebraska. Now, I was like, where did he end up landing? Arizona State. I'm thinking he was going to get the head – or the starting job. Ends up being a, a, a backup there. And he scores a touchdown in that game. He goes – I think he was one for two, but a, a nice run to the corner. Um, but, yeah, my favorite part about, about that um, – Game is the post conference, uh, post conference interview with Denny, Kenny Dillingham. Oh, on the field or, or his press no, conference in the press conference. And one oh, of the sure. he says, he goes, Listen, we've already hit our win to- totals o- over all you guys that bet money on that and you're getting rewarded. Take that money that you won, you got your money back, put it in the collective. We're that's right. Enjoy the wins that we've got so far. We've gotten you smiles on your faces, give it to the collective, and we'll go out and. Nobody else addresses the money collective as much as Kenny Dillingham does, just like straight up. And I kind of love that he does. He's like, listen, I can get you Jaden Rashada if you do this kind of thing. Like, I can get you wins. And he's he's given an ROI. I mean, Arizona State was picked, what, 13th this year by the media and sitting there, what, are they 5-1 and one this year? Yeah, 5-1. and one. Yeah, 5-1. and one. Um, And I feel like it was evident from the second he showed up there, right? Like, I, I think we talked about this last week. Like, last year they got they almost had an upset win over, over Southern Cal. They fought till the end of the, end of every single game, and and yeah, but I mean, just the arrow, the needle's pointing pointing up for Arizona State. Uh, yeah, I can't remember who it was, but some some booster there pledged a million dollars to their NIL fund when at Kenny Dillingham's opening press conference and that. I'd be getting that guy on the phone, be like, "Look what we're doing! Yeah. Look what ammunition we have on the recruiting trail! Now give me a little bit more in the coffers so we can really pay it off." Well, and th- this is a coach that went to school here. He, he this is where his heart is. He wants to see you succeed. You're not going to have a team poach him unless they go crazy for for him. And he hasn't proven himself to be that quite yet. But like, take advantage of this. I mean, ASU was a blunder under uh, wow, what's Herm that? Edwards. Under Herm Edwards, yeah, I think we even seen sanctions passed down on assistant coaches from that now <laughs> this last week. But to, to turn it around this fast as well as he done, props to them. Yeah, I've got I, a couple buddies that are huge Sun Devils fans, so uh, we, we text here and there, and they're just they're, every time they win, dilly dilly, like <laughs> dilly dilly. Uh, no big win for the Sun Devils. Excited to see what comes of it uh, going forward. Again, they're they're one that. As far as I'm concerned, they're basically playing with house money. You'd like to see them get to a bowl game. Ample opportunity to do that between going on the road at Cincinnati. Maybe not, you know, it's that's that's far in terms of travel, but that's a winnable game, right? 100%. At Oklahoma State, home against UCF, probably a win. And then at Arizona in the Territorial Cup at the last one, Arizona looks pretty weak. Like, do they play BYU? They do. Sorry, I was just listing off what I thought were the most obvious wins. BYU is, and they host BYU too. So there's certainly, that's an opportunity. That's one if you're a, a Cougar fan, you got to be nervous about going out to the desert. Yeah. <laughs> we always know that that's, I think we talked, I think we talked about this when we were just in person the other day, but just like going out to the desert, that's probably your like 10, 15 Eastern kick. It's probably the super late game. And those games always get a little wild, get a little spooky. So, um, yeah, there's ample no opportunity for them. But Same. when they're everywhere else, it can go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All righty. A um, couple other games I wanted to touch. I, I caught just the end of the LSU Ole Miss game. Admittedly, like I was mostly watching the Oregon-Ohio State game, so we'll talk tackle that one next. But maybe we quickly touch on Ole Miss-LSU. Um, yeah. I think that game was pretty important for Brian Kelly. I feel like if you lose that game, people are going to start asking some questions, some pretty tough ones. I think you shouldn't – like, you weren't favored to win that game, but it. I kind of agree with you on this. It could have started a downward spiral. Spiral. If you lose a game – like, you lost to USC. Everybody thought you should have won. You're only, I mean, let's be real. They're 5-1, and one, right? They're They're in a good position. But 
if you lost if you lost this game and you lose to Arkansas, you drop another game later on this week later on the season, you start to kind of be like, all right, this isn't quite where we're going in the direction we want. And these LSU fans, we already know this; they can't wait very long. Every single co- co- coach there is won a, won a national most, championship, yeah. and they've been out within three years. You know, or essentially, <laughs> it's like, it feels like that. Um, whether they left on their own to go to Al- go to my Mi- go to Miami Dolphins or they got fired to go to the Bayou, um, I do feel like Brian Kelly has everything he needs coming into the coffers. That their recruiting classes and stuff like that look pretty good and. If I was an LSU fan, I'd give him two or three years. I just don't know if I trust Brian Kelly to ever get over the hump. And the fact that they won this game, okay, that might that's a little bit of a, a, a kudos. But if they drop something that they're not supposed to drop, it kind of just kind of makes me feel like that's the Brian Kelly that I expected. Yeah, I – yeah, I, I feel like – they they skin of your teeth here, skin of your teeth at South Carolina, closer than you wanted to be against UCLA at home. I, my radar is still up on LSU. I don't trust them. Let me put it that way. I don't yeah, trust them. It's a it's a very soft five and one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and you three games in the next and this year, you play Texas A and M, you play Bama, and you play Vanderbilt. We already know that they're going to have Vanderbilt. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I yeah. So that that's my thing. Is I I I you, you heard like Jeff Cameron has what he calls the tent of suspicion, like, oh, no, like t- teams that he just doesn't trust, right? Yeah. And um, I would say that LSU is firmly in my tent of suspicion right now. I feel like Brian Kelly's in my tent of suspicion. The talent is there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, okay. Fair. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, from the other side of this, Ole Miss. Five and two, a one and two conference record thus far, and this was an all-in year for him. I, mm, yeah, exactly. Like, what, what, what do you do now? Because you still have on their remaining schedule at Arkansas, who we've we've covered their 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 game. They'll play someone close. They do play against Oklahoma. I would think Ole Miss should win that game. Like, Ole Miss can score points, and Oklahoma really can't so that, that to me is like all right that that might even be the difference all right 17 to 3 is gonna go old miss's way even if it's an ugly affair but you at arkansas hosting georgia at florida and then home against mississippi state in the egg bowl like there's at least one more loss on there so right? here's the thing is if they go undefeated i think they still control their own destiny because georgia will have two oh no georgia only have one loss if they lose they'll have two conference losses yeah Oh, yeah, they have two conference losses, losses, assuming that they lose to Texas. You'd own the head-to-head with Georgia, um, Bama. I mean, you'd need help with LSU and Texas, right? So those teams would be undefeated, potentially. And Texas A&M is undefeated in conference still. So some, And some of that will shake out, right? Texas plays Texas A&M. And A&M, I don't remember. Yeah, but, but yeah so they, they'll need some help. But you're right. They, like they they're, still- they're not out of it, yeah. Yeah. I though, although you got to be frustrated because I think in your head you were thinking, oh, hopefully we go undefeated and we lose just to Georgia. Like that was in your head. That's what you're kind of hoping for. I didn't you, you probably maybe drop one or two games or one game elsewhere, but I don't think you expected to drop to Kentucky. Like no, that that one's the real wrench in the in the plans there. And the and, LSU and, you should have dropped. I mean, you were in control of that game up until late. Yeah, I mean, I know you may have been like slightly favored in going into the game, but like. I think that's that's a reasonable loss. It's just more like how the game played out. It's like yeah. we gave it up, yeah. But super clutch drive by Garrett M- Nussmeyer. Super fun to watch. Uh, yeah, a couple of, couple of clutch conversions. It. What? I, I and I love the go for it all on in the overtime first play. Boom! Let's go hit a touchdown. Yeah, I I was surprised, frankly, that when they scored the touchdown to force overtime, that Brian Kelly still trotted out the one. After a couple of years ago against L or against FSU, where they got the the, the point after a tenth block, well, and and he he had since then or again the next opportunity he had to do that was against Bama, if you'll recall that same season went for two and they won, and, and so I I honestly as I was watching it, I was like he's gonna go for two, and and I know the play even like I'd have been like all right we're gonna show man but we're gonna switch to zone like right at the very end try and bait him into 
into thinking that flat route, the, the rub route they ran against Florida State several years ago. They ran it against Bama last year. They're going to run it for this one. They ran it against Florida State as Notre Dame, right? As, he, yeah, you're right. Okay, yes. Yes, yeah. thank you for keeping me on track. But he ran it against Florida State, Notre Dame, 2014. They got yeah, called for offensive pass interference. He doesn't get called for it against Bama. Uh, that That is his go-to uh, two-point play. And so I would I would have been all over that one as the defense coordinator, but like, hey, watch this, and if they do anything else that we're not ready for, maybe they deserve to win. But this is clearly a favorite of his. Anyway, all right, big, biggest game of the week. I, I don't know if there are others we want to cover. I know. Um, we'll, only touch, we'll I want to touch Penn State USC real quick. Go. I didn't see much of this game, so I, I, I watched it back on replay. Uh, USC comes out swinging, and Penn State kind of cleans it up. But the thing I kind of take – the takeaway I want to take – I had was the, the game-tying drive where Penn State converts like a fourth and ten, eight and a fourth and ten to keep this game going to score the touchdown to t- tie the game and force it to overtime. Um, that's the Penn State we've not seen. Like in Bro. games that are close, in teams that are, are good, they aren't able to pull out the wins. They are not able to grin and bear it and just be the ones that kind of – Push their way to the end. You never see them beat Ohio State. You never see them beat uh, Michigan, et cetera. Like, that's not never, never. But it's like once in, like, what, 10 tries. Um, but against USC, not that USC is a juggernaut like them, but USC p- came out playing great and had a great uh, game plan. And Penn State basically was able to say, you know what? We know who we are. We know we're this good, and we're going to put this thing in, in, in position and win the game. Also... Big Ten teams again going to the East Coast or West Coast when you cross more two two or more time zones, the teams that cross two or more time zones up until this week were one and eight, with the only win being I think it's like Minnesota against UCLA or something like that. I can't remember what it was. Um, Penn State's one of the teams now. They were able to to do this. They nobody else has really been able to do this except for against UCLA. UCLA also got beat this week again. Um, maybe that was the Minnesota game. I don't even remember. Yeah, it was someone else. I think it was Rutgers. Was it Rutgers that went there and, and beat UCLA? Yes. But, yeah, and, Minnesota was this week. Yeah, so basically UCLA, we all know that – I mean, I'm going to be real. I question that coaching hire 100% when they made that. We're in LA. Yeah, Any I know. questions? <laughs> I, I kind of like the guy. Like, I, I mean, from a personality standpoint, whether or not he has the aptitude for, to be a head coach, like, I, I think that, the, that those questions are on the table. I also feel like, hey, you know what? It was kind of a cluster when he showed up, so I'm not necessarily blaming him. No, I'll, I'll judge. I'll judge him on week two or on year two. In some of these games, they've been a little bit more feisty than I would have thought. Like they played again, they played LSU pretty tough. So and like, I'm not ready to. You lost some very good talent. Let's be real. Yeah. Like, um, you weren't even good last year, and you were able to. Do, uh, you had some of the talent that was gone. Um, yeah, that that's just Penn State team is they're setting themselves up. They're winning the games they need to win, and just got to keep marching there. And with Ohio State loss, you put yourself in a position to have a good chance. Yeah, to be able to that yeah. yeah. they uh, everything's in front of them, and yeah, they've. I mean, they, they maybe have a. A uh, slightly tougher back half of the season. Let's see, at Wisconsin, home against Ohio State, home against Washington, at Purdue, at Minnesota, home against Maryland. So like, you know, I, I don't know. Like Ohio State really jumps out at me as like, okay, that's the only one that I don't expect them to be favored in. And I yep. think it's the only one that I don't expect them to be favored in by multiple scores. Maybe at Minnesota. Right. Maybe. I mean. Minnesota's at Minnesota, played- yeah, at Minnesota, I mean, they're on the road. Minnesota's played a couple, a couple teams pretty tough, like you said. They beat USC um, and just in the road. <laughs> on the road, uh, the end of November in, in – in, <laughs> is it Minneapolis? I can't remember exactly where, where Minnesota – the University of Minnesota is located. But uh, yeah. there's probably going to be snow on the ground. It probably won't be a fun game to play. It'll be really cold. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's maybe one that I'll circle as a hey, just pay extra attention, Penn State. <laughs> be, yeah, really, really be on your P's and Q's that week. Um, anything else from this last week? Oh, do you want to talk Ohio State Oregon? Oh yeah, I skipped it. Sorry. Yep. Uh, banger of a game, just a banger. Um, you know, I part of me in the back of my head, I was, again wrangling all of your children, and I was just like. 
when they go down, I get to lock in. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was fun. You know, your, your kids are you know, they're good kids. But um, yeah, once I was um, sort of relieved of, of duties, uh, yeah, this is a, a really fun game, physical game. I didn't expect there to be that many points. I honestly thought the defenses would sort of rule the day, or at least there'd be a, a pretty long feeling out period in, in the early, maybe like halfway through the second quarter, we start to see a little bit more offensive uh, output. And it just kind of started from the jump. Like the teams are ready to play. I think Will Howard played, in my opinion, his best game. Like I, I was a little skeptical of that take. Honestly, like if you're going to like armchair quarterback it and, and look, back I, i'm a little surprised like or at the time i should say like i'm not looking looking back now that we have this data point i'm like okay maybe they knew what they were doing and getting will howard but like when they picked him up i was a little surprised that that was their choice right like cam ward i think was still technically in the transfer portal i don't think he'd even declared for the draft yet and then withdrawn and, and chose miami so it's like oh will howard's their their choice when i'm i'm certain if Ohio State went calling, Cam Ward's hearing them out, right? Like, like I, I feel like there's no way he wasn't going to consider that. But yeah. my understanding is it wasn't considered because I don't think they ever reached out. Yeah, so I think that, they wanted that, Will Howard, and Will Howard wanted to go there. Yeah, surprising. So, um, and, and so at the time, like I thought that was like a, a questionable decision because Will Howard looked, you know, okay at Kansas State, but nothing nothing super special. Um, and then it turns out that, you know, with the right game plan and with uh, some really special talent around you, like, yeah, world that, class that, yeah, so <laughs> the change of scenery can, can really do, do wonders for, for an individual. And so uh, that was really impressive to me. I knew that they, you know, they kind of had done everything that they needed to do before this, you know, right. Like, but I, I didn't feel like there was any, none of those results were really like eye popping to me. Um, and so them going on the road and, and really having basically every chance to win that game uh, and, and to do it with a, a pretty functional offense against what I thought would be a really, really salty defense that admittedly was missing some pieces. Um, I, like, it's is it weird to say, like, I mean, Oregon played the game of their lives, and I still kind of, my takeaway is still like, Ohio State – like, like you know, that, or maybe that sounds dumb, but I just like, hey, that's a big win for Oregon going forward. Also, when it comes to like, you know, looking toward the with an eye toward the postseason, I, f I feel a whole lot better about Ohio State than I did before this game. I I, I know it sounds maybe sounds stupid because it's a loss, but like I just hadn't seen anything in in their wins that really said like, oh, they're they're an excellent team. And it's like. This one, you can really kind of argue like, man, there was a couple of opportunities that they could have done things a little bit differently. And uh, everyone wants to talk about the clock management with the like the penalty that then rolls the clock. I, I mean, I, I'm i going to extend some grace because I had no idea that that's how that worked. Um, so, I mean, obviously it's, it's inexcusable for you as – as the head coach to not be at least wary of that, or at least have someone on the headset that always has eyes on the clock and just say clock's running timeout right now. Like yeah. we're clearly not ready to run a play. Like, um, so I think that's a learning thing. And one of the things that again is maybe a good or bad thing, depending on your perspective is like that loss is, is detrimental, but not fatal to them. Right. Like they're not going to be excluded from, any of the postseason opportunities. In fact, there's probably a likelihood that we see this game play out again. Um, yeah, if they beat Penn State, and that's State. that's the linchpin, right? Yeah. Uh, and then maybe in the playoffs again. Maybe we get it a third time this year. Oh boy. I, I do think like I I walked away coming. I walked away from this game. Uh, I went back and rewatched it. I'm um, thinking like I'm impressed by these two teams. This team, this game to me, Dan Lanning's coaching in big games feels a little chaotic to me sometimes. Like, this reminded me of the Washington games yes. uh, from last year. But he ended up on top in this, in this game. And the Washington games, he, he he lost. They were close games. But, like, just – I don't know. It's it's a weird feeling when I watch this game. Just some of the things like, oh, I'm going to go for a field goal here. Or, oh, I'm going to go for it on fourth down here. Instead of, like, what your conventional wisdom is. And I feel like he kind of did the same thing against Washington – um, last year, people were like questioning why he didn't go for for a touchdown when he was taking field goals and stuff like that. 
And I don't know. It's just a – I don't know how, how to read Dan Lanning. Maybe his passion is so – I mean, you watch his game. He is such a passionate player. He's not paying attention to what he should be doing. He's just trying to gut check it. And it ended up working for him. But I don't know if I – if you play this game ten times, I don't know if I pick Oregon to win it, you know, the majority of those. Yeah, exactly. That's what. That's kind of what I was – trying to say and I, I don't think i did a good job articulating it like, like you did right there just like you know my takeaway is like ohio state probably lost this game slightly more than oregon won it well i mean when you end the game with will howard sliding and trying to call time out with zero seconds left yeah that's a that's a bummer uh especially yeah field goal wins you the game they were so close um i don't know yeah i, I agree like i think <laughs> uh, yeah i yeah i just like we could go back and do like this. That'd be kind of some fun off season content to go through like the big games with Dan Lanning and like where he's won slash lost them games with uh, some super, super aggressive calls. And I, I feel like he's started to regulate a little bit more. Like I, I'm just saying in, in years past in their opening possession where they're at fourth and three at their own 43, they probably go for that. Like, yeah. I think he's, I think he's pulled the reins in a little bit, but I, I agree. Chaotic is a good way of describing it where it's like, man, I don't think he's super predictable with regard to some of those like game management decisions. I, for for a while there, he was con, you know constantly aggressive, and I was like, okay, all right, th- these are either going to play off, pay off, and work wonders, and you're going to look brilliant, or they're just one or two of them are going to fail, and they're going to fail so spectacularly that you're going to lose the game. But um, yeah, looking looking forward. Yeah, I just see these two. They're on a they're on a crash course, right? Like I I just don't see like maybe Penn State throws a wrench in it. You're right, that's the linchpin. If Ohio State beats Penn State, and I guess they I didn't realize it was a road game, so they have to go on the road to Happy Valley. Oof. That might be tough. We know that's going to be a white game and a and a white out, right? <laughs> it's, well. It, I thought they already announced it, and it's not. Uh, have they announced it? I don't know. I can't remember what it was. I, I think they announced it over the summer, and people were just, yeah, understandably pissed. Like, like I yet. think that's uh, – I could be wrong. No, it hasn't been, hasn't been set yet. Okay. Well, then it's it's, when it's that one or Washington or – so it, it better be that one, right? Like, yeah, Okay. I can't remember. Maybe that was last. Was it last year? At some point, I remember they announced it. It was like Minnesota, and people were like, "Why isn't it?" It must have been either Ohio State or Michigan that they were hosting, and people were just like, "I don't get it. Why wouldn't you give us the very best chance at at winning that game with this environment that is absolutely stunning?" Like, yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, yeah, looking forward to that one in a couple weeks. What's let's see, what is it? Three weeks out looks like something like that. Yeah, November second. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any other things you want to call out from week seven? Oh, the results of this game was kind of interesting to me. So sure. this is the first, only the second time since 2018 that Michigan or Ohio State won't show up into their game with one of them undefeated or both of them undefeated. That's and the crazy. last time that happened was Ohio, Oregon went to, to Ohio State and beat Ohio State. in. Oh, you know, yeah, Mario well, Cristobal's boys. Yeah, it happened in 2021. And then in 2023, they were both undefeated. 2022, they were both undefeated. 2020, they didn't play. Um, 2019, OSU was undefeated. And 2018, Michigan beats uh, – Michigan loses to Notre Dame like the beginning of the the very first game of the year. And then Ohio State drops a game to Purdue. Get, they got blown out by Purdue in that year. But that was in 2018. So this will be the first time that like they the conference doesn't – or the championships doesn't hinge on them to some degree. Um, it could hinge yeah. on them, but maybe not. And, and again, it goes to this parity. Like we're seeing teams that are just as good as other teams, and the fact that they're given the opportunities with these cross conferences or cross country conferences, we're getting to see a lot of uh, interesting stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I had anything else. I guess like Iowa State went on the road at West Virginia. I, I, they take care of business. Yeah, yeah they took care of business. I didn't, I didn't really have a ton. Of takeaways in that game, like again, it was one that was sort of in the quad box. But like I said, I was locked in on that uh, Ohio State Oregon game. Um, yeah, I don't know. We can touch on a few things, maybe kind of going forward. I the guess the only other thing, 
I'm sorry. The only other thing I'd mention is Ashton Jinty. Um, oh, yeah. He's a, was he at 1,248 yards? Not quite half of – or just half of the season, but not quite half of Barry Sanders' records. He's averaging 9.9 .9 yards a carry. Um, he's had two games where he's averaged under 10 yards a carry, which is against Oregon where he carried the ball for 25, bu 25 times. And then against Hawaii last week where he carried the, the ball 31 times. Um, he's still His lowest game is averaging seven yards a carry, 7.7 .7 against Oregon, seven against Hawaii, and then you go to 10 against Washington State University. They, they don't play anybody else that he should not break this record, and he should win the Heisman because of it. As I, long as yeah. Won, and he continues to put up – I mean, you got 17 touchdowns already. It's unreal the numbers he's putting up, even against mediocre talent. Yeah, I saw him, like, his pace versus the last few quarter. I think it was Fox College Football on Twitter that tweeted this out. But the last three running backs to win the award through six games were all, like, in the neighborhood of 650 yards and, and somewhere around, like, seven or eight touchdowns. And it's like, oh, no, he's, like, almost double their yardage and, in most cases, double their touchdowns. Like, just, like – yeah, awesome. He absolutely deserves to be in New York. I don't know if I'm going to go with win the award just yet. I kind of want to see the rest of things play out. But like, I mean, Dylan Gabriel had a great game. I don't think that excuses him from the rest of the games that he's had so far. So I think, again, he's always been sort of a lifetime achievement candidate for me than more than like he's actually yeah. been the best player in the country. I don't. So think I don't. I don't buy that one. I, I still think there's still others that will emerge, right? The, the, I think the favorites right now, and I'll, I'll get the order maybe slightly mixed up, but GT, yeah, um, Cam Ward, Travis Hunter, and Dylan Gabriel. And it's like, I can definitely see a world where someone other than those four wins it. Like, um, And see, I don't see it. one where – you don't. I'm, I'm if so. Jinty's plus one sixty according to DraftKings. I see the favorite. Yeah, the favorite. Dylan Gabriel's at plus four hundred. That seems high to me. I feel like that's a media feeling rather than an overall feeling. Like they're pitching this that like Dylan Gabriel should be a Heisman winner, and not that everybody else buys it necessarily. But we see Cam Ward plus six fifty. Jalen Milrow row plus a thousand. I don't know how that's still there. Oh, Milrow, yeah. And then Travis Hunter plus twelve hundred and Kate Klubnik plus twelve hundred. Kate Klubnik's been balling at Clemson. If they can do something, I don't, the problem is, is they can't do anything until after the the Heisman. Is yeah, right. the only thing that they they that he gets a chance is like if they face Miami in the ACC championship game and they boat race Miami. Like, yeah. okay, all right. And, and Travis Hunter got hurt this week. I don't know if he like he didn't play the second half of this game. I don't know if he plays this. With, and Colorado. Uh, they dropped to Kansas State, so I think what's that, their second loss? It's their second loss. They're and they're going to drop a few more, so I think he falls off. Jalen Milrow, let's be honest, like Alabama's not winning the SEC, so I don't think you have a chance there. And the fact that Texas, uh, you had Quinn Ewers get hurt, and and Arch Manning looked just as good, kind of takes those two out of the pack, and then Carson Beck. Okay, like I think this is this is a can like Dylan Gabriel's a little bit hot, far, farther ahead on the odds, but I think this is a Ashton Cam Ward like race. And I feel like it's Ashton's to lose. As long as they don't as long as Boise State doesn't lose, I think they're fine. I play yeah, UNLV in a couple weeks, so that will be a that'll be a war. Yeah. That'll be a good one. Oh man, that'll be my C T V. Cam Cam Ward's been saved by a few uh referee calls and you know the ACC's doing their best yeah. Their team, yeah. And and how much credit should you get for bailing your team out of a problem you created, right? Like, <laughs> what, three turnovers versus Virginia Tech, two against Cal. We're starting to see that loose – that loose kid. Yeah, yeah, that he's, he's, a, he's a gunslinger. Anyway, we've taken up just about an hour now. The only other person I might throw in there is, is Drew Aller if Penn State wins out. That that that'd be one, and that I yeah, especially if he has a, a big game against Ohio State and is able to yeah. to take them to the Big Ten championship, and something they, they haven't done, and they win it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. All right, well, thanks everyone for paying attention again, tuning in, talk to us, hit us up on our socials, five star reviews, likes and subscribes. We always appreciate it. We'll see you next time.